All right. Whenever I hear someone tell me, you know, the Bible is really just a book of moral stories. And if I'm a good person, I don't really need the Bible, do I? I think to myself, you haven't really read the Bible, have you? <laughs> when we look at the Bible, it's so much more than just a list of moral stories and a list of rules and laws that we need to follow. But this is exactly the perspective that so many people bring to not only reading the Bible, but how to be Christians, what their religion should be. They think that following a set of rules and laws is what God wants from them. And this is exactly the attitude we see in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 21. Now, you're, you're most likely familiar with this story of a rich man coming to Jesus and saying, Rabbi, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? Or actually, what he says is, what do I need to do in order to obtain eternal life? And Jesus tells him, you, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, these are just the commandments. I'll accept the last one, that's from Deuteronomy. <laughs> the rich man says, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? He's following all the rules. He knows all 613 commandments, and he's followed each and every one to the letter. Jesus answers, answers, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You see, if you want eternal life, it's not enough to follow all the rules. You have to learn from the person who already has it. Because eternal life isn't about rules. It's about living. And you need to know how to live. And Jesus is the model of eternal life. We see again where Jesus is faced with a similar question in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Now, the Pharisees come to him. And one of them, an expert in the law, asks him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now Jesus knows how the Pharisees think about the law. They are very much about their traditions. They don't really care what the Bible says so much. They think that their traditions supersede and over are, are more important than anything that it says in the scripture. So Jesus meets them on that level. He quotes their very tradition, but he quotes directly from the scripture. This same argument was made by a pair of rabbis uh, in the previous century. He tells them, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't like this translation very much because soul in Hebrew is nefesh. And, excuse me, it's ruach. It is breath. Love the Lord your God with your every breath and your every thought. That is what Jesus is saying. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, are these commandments? Not really. Loving someone is not something you can do. It's not a rule you can follow. You love someone or you don't. But this is what Jesus calls us to. He's saying that you can't just follow a set of rules. You have to change the way you think, the way you live, with your every thought and your every breath. It's not enough to follow the rules. Now, Paul struggles to give us this explanation. 
We see in Romans chapters 6 and 7, he is arguing to a group of Jews and Greeks who are arguing between the Torah and Stoic philosophy. And Stoic philosophy says that your thoughts and your actions and your essential self are separate things. All right. According to Stoic philosophy, my words and my deeds are two separate things. So if I say things that offend you, well, that's really how you take it. And that has nothing to do with me. Because my words and my essential self are two different things. And how you take my words, well, that's on you. You can see how this goes to a toxic place very quickly. And Paul is arguing against that, but he's also arguing against the group that says, well, it's all about following the Torah. If you just follow the Torah, you can, you can really just ignore all that toxic stuff that you're thinking about, you Greeks. And Paul says it's neither about following the rules and you can't separate yourself from what you say and believe and do. He says it's not about having the right beliefs. It's not about doing the right things and it's not about the commandments you follow. He says in chapter 8, verse 1, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about the Spirit throughout chapter 8. He's leading to his next argument. But that therefore, that tells us that it sums up what comes before and it's leading into what's coming next. That's his thesis. There is no condemnation. If you're living by laws, if you're living by a set of rules like the rich man, well, you're going to be judged by a set of rules. But if you are living in Christ Jesus, if God's spirit is within you, if, like he says in chapter 7, you died to the flesh and you live again in the spirit, there is no judgment. Because judgment comes when you die. Well, we have all died in our bodies and we've been born again in the spirit. And that is why there is no law to judge us. Because the law only applies until you die. But when we were baptized, we were all born again. And that is his point. There can be no condemnation now. We can be sure of our salvation. And while Paul's arguments in Romans are very, very difficult to follow, I think James makes a better general case in chapter 2, verse 14. I'm just going to turn there a little because in chapter 2, verse 14, he's talking about this same Stoic philosophy that if you just hold the right beliefs, you'll go to heaven, right? If we, if we have the right theology and we believe the right things, that will lead us to heaven. That's what the Stoics are arguing. You just have to have the right beliefs. Well, if that's true, then us in the Church of Christ are going to be in a very awkward position if the Catholics are right, because they believe they're the only church. Well, what if the Lutherans are right, that the Catholics aren't the only church, but that our beliefs are, also aren't valid? If we're saved by our beliefs, we're all in a world of trouble, because we don't all believe the same thing. Even right here in this room, we don't all believe the same thing. So which of us is going to heaven? Well, that's a tough, <laughs> exactly, that is a tough standard to meet, especially since the Bible is very, very old and very, very complicated. And finding those right beliefs is like finding a needle in a haystack. So James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose... A brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, 
if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, if you have all the right beliefs, if you know what to do, but you don't care, take care of the orphan and the widow and the stranger, the foreigner in your land, if you don't take care of refugees, as the Bible tells us to do, then what good is your faith? And this is the standard by which we are judged, if we are judged at all. He says, but if someone will, will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and tremble. You see, demons in the scripture means foreign gods. And the foreign gods know that there's one God, and they're still going about proclaiming themselves as gods. Their followers are still proclaiming them as gods, even if they know better. If that's the case, then why aren't those foreign gods saved? Because they should know better. Mm -hmm. They don't do what they believe. If the angels in heaven aren't proclaiming God, and they know better, if they aren't doing what they believe, then how are they saved? But if you're wondering now, how do I know if I'm saved? And that's really the question that I'm trying to answer. Do you know that, that you have the Spirit? Well, sometimes you feel the Spirit and sometimes you don't. And that's a very personal experience of God. Do you feel the presence of God? That's what the Spirit is. Do you feel God's presence? Do you know when you pray? Do you know when you sing? Do you know when you're in the, fe in the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you feel God present here? That's how you know that you're saved. But if you don't know that, if you don't feel that, how do you know? Do you dedicate your life to God? Do you do what's right? Not just because you have a set of morals that you must follow because, you know, you want to make your parents proud. <laughs> you don't want to go to jail, whatever the reason. If you, if you follow a moral compass because it is ingrained within you, because it's who you are, because that's who Christ has made you. That is how God has transformed your life. That also is how you know you're saved. But there's one more way that you know that you're saved. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jew Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Now what's he saying? We see your faith by your works. And he's coming in the middle of the night because he doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want people to know that he's asking Jesus these questions. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus said. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And this is our earliest reference to baptism. Well, not our earliest. We have John the Baptist, of course. Oh, yeah. But this is the first reference we have to baptism for repentance of sins, for salvation. And he says, when you are baptized, you are born again. You die to the flesh, and you are born in the Spirit. Every one of us. 
You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. If we're following the rules, the rule book, you know exactly where we're going. But we're not following the rule book. We're following what God put on our hearts. Like a compass. Like a compass. <laughs> and... That doesn't distill down to a set of rules. We do what we know is right, what we pray for, and what God puts on our hearts. Now, farther, on, farther along, in verse 13, Jesus says, No one has gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man came to be lifted up. The snake in the wilderness, if you don't know the example, is when the people of Israel were dying because snakes were literally biting at their feet and they were dying. And God told Moses, raise the snake up on the sap. And everyone who looks up to it will be saved. that Moses gave the example. They look up by faith, and by their faith, they are saved. Not because they do the right thing, not because they know, have the right beliefs, but because they have faith in the one who saves them. Now, holding up a snake on a stick isn't going to save anyone from a snake bite. We know that. <laughs> It's just like taking a dip in the water isn't going to make you clean. You need soap for that. The difference is God. God saves our souls. God makes us clean. And so with a useless action, that is how we know that the power of God is with us. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's it. We look up to Jesus. We pattern our lives after him. We have faith in God that God will save us, and by our faith, and through God's grace, we are saved. Not because of anything we did, but because God wanted so desperately to save us that he sent his son, and his son believed in us and wanted to save us, that he sacrificed himself. He lived as that perfect example and died as that perfect sacrifice. And he says in verse 18 that whoever believes in him is not condemned. We don't need to follow the perfect set of rules. We don't have to understand every commandment in this book. And where, to, where it contradicts itself. Where we have to say, I don't know if I'm supposed to follow it this way or this way. We take it by faith that God will save us in the end anyways, so long as we're trying, so long as we're working, mm -hmm. so long as we keep doing the things that we are supposed to be doing, that God puts on our hearts to do. And that doesn't mean that we have to follow every commandment. There might not be a widow or an orphan or a refugee in our lives to save. But we keep looking. And in the end, God is faithful. God God gives us not only eternal life, a better way of life, a better way of living our lives here and now, but in the hereafter, in the life to come, he will bring us to resurrection. And we will stand not condemned, but we will stand beside Jesus who will say, Father, this is my brother, this is my sister, this is my sibling and my good friend. And that's why we will be invited into God's home. Amen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Yeah.